into the City Club, Roosevelt University, University of Illinois Chicago Political Science Department. First effort at reinvigorating a concept that we used to do many years ago called Crossroads Conferences every two years, where we would discuss politics. Uh, kind of went down, well, kind of disappeared when Sangamon State disappeared and uh, Paul Green disappeared from Governor State. So uh, now we're back. Uh, hopefully this will be the start of a every two years and uh, God willing, the weather willing, at lunch we will have Sabato here. So uh, uh, no, George Allen will not be with him. He's uh, Great jokes. Uh, He's hunting deer. He hunt, I just, I got that. But I'm very happy that, by the way, for those of you who uh, want to take notes but are too lazy, uh, this whole program will be on Can TV. We have the head of Can TV right over there. Please stand up. Kathy, introduce your. Uh, oh, no, that's the president of the board, not the executive director, Peter Scozzi. Peter Scozzi. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. And at lunch, Can TV will be joined by a lot of other uh, TV and radio. Unfortunately, they don't really want to cover us up here. So, uh, anyways, welcome. Uh, I do have a cold. I caught it in Cambridge, uh, England, a uh, punting on the river. And if you want to know why I did it, I don't have a logical explanation. So let's just forget it. Uh, it's you never get too old to do things stupid. All right. All of you should have, we're doing the state right now, all of you should have a copy, there are three maps. The city, the, the, the suburban cook, and the, and, and the state of Illinois. Uh, there will be a quiz to see which one of these you think was done by a computer and which one was hand drawn. <laughs> I personally can't figure it out, but maybe some of you can. All right, the way this is gonna go, I'm gonna start off and present around 10 minutes of Rock'em Sock'em Insight. Then my three panelists there, are going to comment on what I say or comment on what the hell they want to say. No difference. There may be a slight interchange. And then we're going to throw it open for questions. The microphone is right there. And uh, we'll try and have a little go around. Uh, so here we go. We're starting only 10 minutes late. Buckle your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy ride. All right. Um, as you can tell from the maps, for the last eight races, seven, the first seven of which for governor were won by Republicans, uh, you're in a very blue city. Uh, you also see with the suburban townships that because of previous Republican victories, it's very red. And then if you go take the state of Illinois, you look at it and you can see where the Republican strength has been central and northern Illinois, and much more competitive in southern Illinois. Uh, starting in 2002, though, uh, things are be really beginning to change. So let me give you four basic points, and then a little more stuff, and then we'll get to our panelists. Number one, in the seven string Republican victories, four Thompson, two Edgar, one Ryan, from 76 to 98, in suburban Cook County, no Republican candidate for governor received less than a 109,000 vote majority. That's why it's so, it's so red. The only blues are the Little Calumet Township and, of course, the People's Republic of Evanston Township. Um, in 2002, in the Blagojevich race against Jim Ryan. Not only did Ryan carry it by over 109,000 votes, Blagojevich carried it by over 50,000 votes. So instead of suburban Cook County cutting into the big margins that the Democrats make up in Chicago, it added to the margins, which is part of the problem that the Republican Party in Illinois faces. Many years ago, when most of my panelists except one were in swaddling clothes. Uh, I started writing for Illinois Issues, and the first thing I did with my old running mate, Peter Kobe, when we looked at the data, was to suggest that in statewide races, downstate's the key to victory. That is no longer the case. In many sense, downstate's almost irrelevant. No disrespect to my other counties. 
And the reason is because of starting with point one. The Chicago margins are no longer, eat, uh, no longer cut into by what happens in suburban Cook and the Collar counties. Point number two, and this will be the second part of it. In those seven Republican victories, four Thompson, two Edgar, one Ryan, no Republican candidate for governor had less than 147,000 margin and had percentages that were in the 60s and 70s. Jimmy Ryan's percentage in 2002 was 58%. So even the hard charging chairman of the, <coughs> can't see me, Senator Dillard, well, there you are, even the hard charging DuPage County chairman is getting winning percentages and margins, but they aren't what they used to be. Even though locally the Republicans control everything in statewide races, it is becoming much more competitive. So if you can't add to the margin in, if you can't cut away the Chicago margin in with, the, with, with suburban Cook, and the collars no longer give this enormous uh, vote margin for Republicans, Cook County just dominates. It just overwhelms the rest of the state. And that is why we basically have landslides for Democrats, for president, for governor, Blagojevich won by a quarter of a million votes. Uh, if you look at the map, uh, he lost a lot of counties downstate. No people. Where the people are is what's hurting the Republican Party. Point number three, the city of Chicago. Uh, well done by my assistant, by the way. If I was doing it, they would not be in the line, so don't even try. Northwest side. For those of you old Chicagoans, Roman Paczynski's old ward, um, the northwest side, 41st ward, and something along the lakefront. But by and large, Chicago's all blue. And even though it's lost population, even though the vote totals aren't as great as they used to be, the percentages have just gone out off the wall. I said this yesterday. I was in Lombard to a group, and they couldn't believe it. In 1960, rumor has it that then Mayor Richard J. Daley really went all out for John Kennedy for president. Rumor has it. And John Kennedy did great in the city of Chicago. He got 63% of the vote. Any Democrat running statewide today who gets only 63% of the vote in Chicago probably would be a... Okay, Alan Keyes as a Democrat, that might, that might do it. But... We're now in the mid 70s, high 70s, 80%. So though the population has diminished, the vote totals have diminished, the percentages have gone so far out of kilter that Chicago is now producing these overwhelming margins. Now, back in 1948, some of my senior students from our campus in Schaumburg, they remember 1948. Uh, Chicago almost cast 50% of the vote in the state of Illinois. Harry Truman's great victory, Paul Douglas, Adley Stevens. Everyone has argued, including me, well, Chicago's power has diminished. Absolutely true. Chicago is now a junior partner in its own region. Yet, because of the geopolitical breakdown of this state, it is producing margins now that have more impact given the suburban changes than it did in 1948. By the way, that's my, <clears throat> that's my biggie. If that doesn't strike you. Thank you, Kathy. A tad late, but thank you anyways. Now, three more quick sub points and then we'll get to the panelists. In 2002, following the Green thesis that even though it casts less percent of the vote, it has a bigger impact, Cook County, Chicago and suburban Cook only cast 39% of the statewide vote. Point two, Blagojevich carried Cook County by nearly 469,000 votes. Point three, the collars cut into this and reduced the margin to 322,000. And downstate, Ryan won by 70,000, but it wasn't enough, and so he lost the state by a quarter of a million. What this simply boils down to 
is that unless the Republican Party in the state of Illinois can either find a way to regain its strength in the collars where it crushes its Democratic opposition or imports people down to the central and northern part of the state, it is going to have a very difficult time winning a statewide race. Just unless, you know, leaving out the U.S. attorney and other kinds of outside influences. Final point. Given all that, uh, and given the chances, you know, of having real problems in the city, I still stick to what I've been saying for 25 years. The Republicans are in pro pro have problems when they discuss philosophy. The Democrats are in problem when they discuss race. As long as Chicago remains at peace racially, the Democrats are going to have a tough time losing. As long as the Republicans keep fighting among themselves who's the true Republican and stop using the famous word rhino, Republicans in name only, which is another way of saying we want to lose, but we'll win the explanation. Uh, they're going to have a very difficult time to win a statewide race. These maps show quite clearly that I will say to you that in 2000, after November, when we redo the maps, um, it's going to get bluer. It's going to get pinker. Uh, some of these townships now are going to become very, very, very democratic. La I said last point, but take the suburban township one. Look at Mighty Thornton Township, just south of the city. Mighty Thornton Township, it's pink. Only reason it's pink is because back in the 70s and 80s, it was heavily Republican, heavily white. Today it is very mixed with a, with a huge middle class black population. It produces margins for Democratic candidates equal to two and a half wards in the city of Chicago. And when you start having that kind of situation, You've got to find new, either convert people to your party or find new ways to uh, attract new voters or else the, the numbers are just going against you. Well, that's my little spiel. Uh, Kent, why don't you start? Let me, oh, let me introduce him. Always a charming host. On the right, we have Kent Redfield from the University of Illinois in Springfield who is probably probably the number one expert on campaign financing in the state of Illinois. I think that's a fair thing. Use the mic. Oh, use you the mic. notice how when he introduces us, he gets off mic. <laughs> <laughs> Skipping right along. Well, how about a round of applause for Kent Redfield, University of Illinois Springfield. <laughs> to his left is the uh, one and only Rich Miller, who's now back in Springfield, Capital Facts, and I'm sure most of you get his, uh, all, most of the time, daily report. Occasionally there's a slight slippage there, but, uh, and, and uh, Rich Miller, uh, probably, uh, I can't give you a compliment, my God. It would, it I know, would, I just insulted you. Yeah, no, that's okay, I, I like that, <laughs> but give me a compliment, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Probably the hardest working uh, person down in Springfield when it comes to getting scoops and also getting free beer. How about a round of applause for Rich Miller? <laughs> and then from my- I remember that one. And then from my old, I wanna, then from my old stomping grounds in the south suburbs, working for the Daily South Town, Kirsten McCreary, who writes uh, a wonderful column that I read uh, uh, most of the time. Uh, and she has become a, broke a couple of really big stories that she may wanna talk about. How about a big round of applause for Kirsten? And you're still a new mommy, right? A new mommy, too. Yeah. All right, Kent, <laughs> after that brilliant introduction, take over. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about the money side of this, and I am responsible for the green brochure, and I will resist the temptation to read it to you. Uh, the facts are pretty solid, but they are facts with an attitude, and so, you know, you need to take that into account when you look at the brochure, but it does give you a pretty good overview, and so I'm, I'm just going to make a, a couple of simple points. In terms of the election environment, Illinois is the wild, wild west of campaign finance. We have no limits, uh, no prohibitions. Uh, on where you get your money or how you spend it. The old joke is if a candidate 
were to get a solicit a million dollar contribution from the Columbia drug cartel and use 100,000 of that to hire a hitman to assassinate their opponent, the State Board of Elections only concern as far as the Illinois election law would be that you filed the proper receipt and expenditure forms uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, uh, Kent, you know who's sitting at that table over <laughs> there. Yeah, okay, go so uh, it is a very wide open system, and that means you can move a lot of money in a, in, a, in a hurry. But you also have to remember that money is a means to an end. The old saw is that the person with the most money does not always win, but people with money always beat people without money. And you know, money can make up for a multitude of sins in terms of, of not having a, a base or not having name recognition or those sorts of things. So money is terribly important, and it can become terribly important in Illinois. Uh, in terms of legislative elections, uh, we spent uh, over $2 million on, depending on how you count it, uh, on three Senate campaigns last time around. We had a candidate spend a million and a half as an individual candidate for a seat in the Illinois Senate. Uh, in the Illinois House, we spent uh, a million and a half on two separate races and had a candidate uh, spend about $800,000. So uh, legislative races are very expensive. The flip side of that is competitive legislative races in Illinois are very rare. Uh, because of the map, uh, which is drawn to minimize competition but favor the Democrats, there just aren't that many opportunities. And, and I, I'm sure Rich is going to talk a little more in detail about the specific cases, but you know there are probably only five Senate races and maybe four to eight, but I, I think closer to four House races that are, are truly competitive. But those are going to be very expensive, and not because they raise money locally, but because the legislative leaders will raise money and move those into that campaign. We spent $2.5 million on a race two years ago uh, down in Carbondale in the 59th District. Uh, we didn't raise $2.5 million locally in Carbondale. Uh, that campaign was one of the real growth industries in that uh, particular part of the state that year. And it is always amazing how, in addition to money from the legislative leaders, that a, a manufacturing firm in Rockford or a labor union in Chicago will find their way to a race down in, uh, in Carbondale. So these are legislative leader-dominated kinds of of, uh, of, of uh, contests. And, and, and the choices the leaders make are going to be critical in terms of what is competitive and what's not competitive. I mean, you, obviously, you can't elect a, Demo a Republican in the middle of Chicago, no matter how much money you spend. But on these areas where there are competition, the legislatures are the ones that drive it. Uh, quick comment on judges. Uh, you know, we elect judges in Illinois, and then people are always surprised that the people running judicial campaigns act like they were in a real election. Uh, and then people are always surprised that when those judicial elections are over, people interpret the results as if we just had an election. Uh, and so judicial elections are becoming more and more indistinguishable from any other election in Illinois. I would point out that the $2.4 million spent in the 5th Judicial District uh, last year to elect a candidate to uh, Car Justice Carmeier to the Supreme Court was the most expensive judicial race in history in the United States. No, 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 nowhere in the United States have we spent more money uh, getting a, a, electing a judge uh, in a statewide contest. And uh, we'll see a mini replay of this down in the fifth appellate uh, 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 There's a, a judicial race down for, in the appellate court in the fifth district uh, uh, McGinn versus Stewart, that's going to be just a, a mini replay of this. So judicial elections are all of a something that's interesting. Statewide, uh, last time around, Rod Bogoyevich spent about $24 million, and Jim Ryan spent 15. He spent, Jim Ryan spent more money than anyone ever spent on a state rise race, except he got outspent by Rod Bogoyevich by, you know, eight or nine million dollars. Uh, again, you can write a $100,000 check and so are you going to solicit 100 people for $1,000 each, or are you going to look for somebody that has, uh, you know, a, a $100,000 check? And so big money comes into these campaigns. Uh, the downstate, down-ballot ones, uh, we can take care of those right now. Uh, other than the treasurer's race, we're talking uh, Secretary of State, Attorney General, 
and uh, uh, Comptroller. Okay, so basically Blue State, challengers, no base, no name recognition, no money, no chance. I mean, you know, that, that's pretty much where, that takes care of those races. We don't need to talk about those anymore. The treasurer's race is open. <laughs> the treasurer's race, the treasurer's race is uh, an open seat. Uh, the problem with that race in terms of money is that it's hard to raise more than two or three million dollars or spend two or three, more than two or three million dollars if you're running for treasurer. And I would want, if I had no base, no name recognition, uh, and, and particularly if I was fighting uh, the demographic and, and uh, political trends in this state, I'd want to have four or five million dollars to run statewide to really uh, let people know who I'm running for, you know, what I'm running for and who I am. So money is always an issue down ballot and you tend to get swept along by whatever is going on at the, uh, the top of the ticket. Uh, that gets us to the governor's race. Uh, the, the Governor Bogoyevich has spent 12, he's sitting on 11 as of you know, the 1st of July. The treasurer spent uh, about three and she was had a million and a half as of the 1st of July. We won't get new money, no new totals until pre-elections which come on the 23rd of October. Uh, we will get a1s, which are big contributions within 30 days of the election, you know, we're going to get that uh, on the 11th of October. So we don't know at this point, but, uh, you know, the money situation, money is always a threshold issue. Getting out spent, you know, two to one is not fatal if your one is big enough. And so that's really the critical question in terms of the governor's race uh, as far as money. Uh, are, you, are, you know, are you going to have enough money to really be visible and to let people know what your, what your issues are? But then, you know, uh, things can, you know, you know, this is always but the caveat is that money is a means to an end and events can overwhelm a situation. You know, sometime in the spring or early summer, of 2001, George Ryan became unelectable. He was an incumbent governor. He could have raised money from that point and, you know, forever, and he was unelectable. So, you know, money only gets you so far. So I will, you know, I've already rambled too long. I've, I'll, I'll be happy to chat about this later. Thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I wanted to, to, to speak to something that Paul was mentioning earlier about how the Republican Party is doomed unless they get their act together. And part of it has nothing to do with the Illinois Republican Party. If you take a look, that um, in 1994, they swept everything except the Supreme Court. They had the, hop, the Illinois House, they had the Illinois Senate, they had the governor's office, they had every constitutional office. Uh, and since 1994, they're coming for you, Paul. Since 1994, that's not the cops either. Um, <laughs> since 1994, um, this state has moved strongly away from the national Republican direction. This state has been... Uh, dominated for years and years by liberal Republicans. And those liberal Republicans are now Democrats, or at least voting that way. They may not consider themselves that. Take a look at Lake County. Lake County was a bastion of a liberal Republican and conservative, more conservative in the North, but a bastion of liberal Republican politics. And slowly but surely, and surely that county is being uh, more and more dominated by Democrats. Uh, suburban Cook, more and more. Um, I've seen um, some polling in some of these legislative races where the, the state legislative candidates are leading, but George W. Bush's polling numbers are just awful, uh, at worse than Topinka's, and that's, kind of, it's, it's, Topinka's are pretty bad too, and in every suburban legislative race and polling that I've seen, Judy Bartopinka is losing to Rob Blagojevich, and these are Republican districts. Uh, he has, uh, and, and that brings me to what happens here and now. So you've had this trend over the years of moving away from the National Republican Party, the, the, the more conservative, the revulsion in some ways, uh, with the National Republican direction. 
And on the state side, you've had some pretty smart Democrats taking advantage of it. Uh, people like Terry Link up in Lake County, uh, the, the, the chairman there. And you've had some national uh, demographic changes like what you've seen in Cicero and in the south suburbs, which, as Paul pointed out, was once an all-white uh, bastion and is now uh, racially mixed, big black middle class there. Um, and that's had a lot to do with it as well. But smart Democrats, people like Rod Blagojevich, who is a very extremely smart campaigner and understands that money is the way of doing things. Um, he has essentially uh, convinced the people of the state, to, uh, except for like a third of them, that Judy Bartopinka is more corrupt than he is and that Judy Bartopinka is just as corrupt or maybe more corrupt than George Ryan was. And that's pretty astonishing. I mean, I don't know if you know Judy Bartopinka. I've known her for 16 years. She's too cheap to be corrupt. <laughs> so, I've been waiting to use that line for about a week. <laughs> um, so, I mean, she's been swamped. She's been swamped by what everything that Paul said, uh, everything that Kent said, uh, by her own inability to put together a uh, to put together a theme of any kind, except I'm not Rod, and it's not working because people are um, not yet anyway. People are naturally inclined to be Democrats, and so if they think they're both corrupt, they'll just go with the Democrat. Uh, and she's just got to get much, much tougher, and we can talk about that a little bit more later on. But uh, I think I'll just uh, hand it over. Well, right now in the House, it's really boring. Um, uh, there are three downstate races that are hot right now, and uh, four, I'm sorry, um, and um, it's mostly just incumbent protection. Mike Madigan, the Speaker of the House, is not on the attack anywhere. I and mean, he was going to go after Terry Park in the, in the Cook County suburbs. He was looking at other races all over the place in Will County, et cetera, uh, Winnebago. Uh, and all he's doing now, all of his money is being spent to defend his incumbents. And the reason that is, is because Rob Blagojevich's numbers, while great in this part of the world, really uh, aren't great in a downstate. I mean, he's, he's bringing Democrats down. People don't like him. But as Paul said, there just aren't enough people to impact the statewide race yet. Um, but they can impact House races. And a lot of these House districts that he's defending, uh, Madigan's defending, are, are only slightly Democratic to begin with. And if you've got a drag on a ticket like uh, Rob Blagojevich, the only thing that's saving them right now is that, you know, they say, thank God, Judy's numbers are even worse. Um, in the Senate, Emil Jones is trying to pick up a bunch of seats. And he's really only defending one in southern Illinois, Vince DiMuzio's old seat that's held now by his widow, Deanna. But he's on the attack all over the place. Up, in, uh, uh, in, up here in Cook County, he's got a couple of races. He's got one up in Lake County uh, that he may not have such a great uh, time with. And he's trying to pick up a seat in Champaign, in a corridor between Champaign and Danville. That it's a pretty close race, I think. Um, uh, the, the problem in Champaign is going to be Rod uh, for the Democrats and, and uh, this craziness in Washington right now. Uh, for the Republicans, um, and which is going to impact, I mean, we haven't even talked about that yet, the, 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 the complete, utter national collapse of, of the Republican Party at a national level um, has just been, it's been really painful to watch. And, um, and it will impact races here as well. So, all right, uh, I think, you know, they could spend a couple, three, four, five, six million dollars in these legislative races and maybe the Senate will pick up a seat or two in the Democrats, and, uh, and the House is just hoping to hold on to what they got right now. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Round of applause for Miller. Don't go overboard. Kirsten, you're up. Where to begin? Um, I guess as I was driving here, I was trying to think of what I wanted to talk about, and I think the thing that surprises me most about the statewide races, particularly the governor's race, is all the the stories of corruption that don't seem to be having much traction with voters when you look at poll numbers. I was trying to just make a list while I was sitting up here of all the different headlines that we've seen about Blagojevich over the course of his administration. 
We're talking about um, million dollar fundraising trips to California with individuals who are now getting ready to plea out with the federal government over uh, schemes for how to get money to his campaign through board appointments and pension business. We're talking about hiring schemes where they took advantage of laws that are set aside for our veterans and used interns and other other forms to get around state laws to protect um, protect people like our veterans for getting state jobs. Um, close advisors and friends of the governor getting contracts and business with the state tollway. Gifts to a daughter's college fund. I think we've really just scratched the surface of that story. I mean, maybe this is maybe this is something that is pretty common among elected officials as a way to give behind-the-scenes fundraising that has yet to really explode onto the onto the scene. We have the state auditor general in Illinois, a fellow Democrat, who has just released month after month scathing reviews of nearly every state agency under Blagojevich's administration. And these are just things that I jotted down while I was sitting up here. I mean, the list goes on and on. And yet, he is ahead of the Republican opponent in the polls. And as Rich said, has managed to raise so much doubt about her that people are considering voting for a Green Party candidate or not going to the polls at all. Um, I think it's a really amazing um, story about the state of politics in Illinois. Citywide, without even getting into all the problems that the administration in the city is facing, I, f I find it so interesting that last year we had some front page stories about a cocaine and heroin ring being run out of a city water plant right down the street, and it was a one or two day story. I mean, what does that say about voters and our um, corruption fatigue that we have a story like that rolling in and out of the papers with, you know, nary a, a pickup mention um, on some of the statewide wires. So I think, um, to me, that's the most interesting aspect of this election, and it makes me wonder, is it just the press that we're getting all worked up about stories that the public really doesn't care about? Is that what it is? Because the news media certainly seems to think that the hiring scandals and the corruption is, is a big deal, and that's the focus of almost all the stories that you read now about the Blagojevich administration. But voters have, do voters care? That, that's what I think will be the most interesting thing to me. Is our appetite such that we are willing to ignore a little dirty government and because we support the democratic principles that Blagojevich has pushed, like health care and expanding health care for working families and children. And is that the message that is really getting across to voters more so than what, what reporters are writing about? I also think it's the first time we're really seeing a statewide election where the internet and technology has changed so dramatically the way that the news media reports stories. I'm on Rich Miller's blog 10, 15 times a day to keep updated on what people are saying. Um, it's a forum now for state workers or people who feel they've been wronged to come forward anonymously. And these, these are the types of um, starting points now for criminal and federal investigations contracts, contributions, it's all available online, so it's it's so much simpler now than even five years ago to track a contribution to a state job, or at least raise the question out there. Ten years ago, I, 11 years ago, I was an intern in Springfield, and in order to look at the campaign finance documents that Kent has become such an expert on, I had to go down to the State Board of Elections office in Springfield, check out a big reel of microfilm and sit there and take notes and write down who, you know, who was raising money and where it was coming from. There was no way to find a specific contribution or to track a person um, donating money. Now you can do all of that sitting at your computer in, in a matter of minutes. And I think it's one area where the news media in that regard is really driving um, coverage because it's so much easier to, to th turn those stories around day after day. So I guess those are those are just my my observations about the the race, and I think what has been said about the Republican nominee Judy Bartomink is very true. She's underfunded. Um, I don't think she's come out with really any bang up ideas that really have the Republican base excited. But I also think it's it's unfortunate that part of what she's battling is not only 
Rod Blagojevich and his 17 and 20 million dollar campaign fund, but also the conservative wing of her own party, which s circulates um, bad information about her. They, the, a lot of the conservative websites that I'll go to will actually direct you to a link to the Blagojevich website to trash Topinka. It just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense um, for me in terms of trying to revive the Republican Party. So I guess those are my thoughts and I'll wait to hear what Very good, have a question. round of applause. Uh, one small uh, addition or maybe a little correction. Most of the stuff on Miller's website, you know, those, those blogs, he writes them. <laughs> yeah, right. I thought it was you, actually. <laughs> I mean, you know, all these names, you know, I mean, he, he writes them. Yeah. All right, well, uh, before we get to the questions, the old moderator here, uh, emphasis on the old part, um, all three of these folks, uh, and by the way, we do have the head of the State Board of Elections, Dan White, stand up. Well, there he is. <laughs> and that hard-charging member, a former student of Professor Green's, the Honorable Bill McGuffin. Stand up, McGuff. Let them show who they are. All right. Now, none of us are very positive about what's going to happen to the Republican Party in Illinois in 2006. And uh, Rich is right. I still have that big poster that was given to me in 1994 when they swept, when Republicans swept everything. So in a dozen years, it's from the top, you know, from the top to the bottom. Is and you, I'll just throw it open, then we can ask for questions. But the panelists try and respond to this question. Two parts. Is it simply the fact that the Republicans are fighting each other? Because remember when Jim Egger ran twice for governor, each time he had a primary challenge, each time uh, somebody, the first time was that, I forgot the kid's name, but uh, he got 25% of the vote. And the second time was Jack Roser who got 33% of the vote. So that split has always been there in the primary, but they came back in the general. Is it because they're simply off the reservation and that they, they won't unite? And I agree with Kirsten that some of the most vicious stuff against the Pinka comes from Republicans, uh, calling her the liberal candidate, calling her uh, all kinds of names. Uh, it's brutal. So the question is, is the, are they just unwilling to support each other? And what kind of Republican, part two, what kind of Republican candidate can be competitive in the state of Illinois statewide? I just want to make one quick point. Jack Rose, or Jack Rosa got 33% yep. in uh, 94. Uh, in 94. Judy got, what, like 36% this year in the primary. So, I mean, the Republican Party in this state right now, if you put the moderates, uh, divide them up between moderate and conservative, it's almost 50-50 with the conservatives outnumbering the moderates, really. If you look at what's happened in Florida, this, this, uh, this, this woman that got nominated down there for, for U.S. Senate. The, Catherine the, Harris. Catherine Quick Harris. Count. Who's, Quick who's, count. Who's, who's going to get clobbered in the general election, but because she was supported by the right wing of her party, she got the nomination of, uh, over a bunch of other people. Um, and she's a nut. <laughs> Don't hold back, Rich. <laughs> well, I mean, I, well, you know, Glenn Hodes, our former campaign manager, is a friend of mine. We had dinner the other night. I was appalled. Um, anyway, so I think you've got, there's a wing of the Republican Party that just doesn't want to win, that would rather just nominate people that can't win. I don't think Oberweiss could have won. And so this thing is going to continue and continue and continue until they're somehow convinced that that's the wrong way to go. But they've been doing this at least in my lifetime since Percy. Remember when they turned against Percy? Um, uh, and they, the, a lot of conservatives wanted to go with Paul Simon, figuring he's so liberal, one term, and we'll be able to take him out in six years. Well, that didn't quite work, did it? 1984, a lot of people in the state of Illinois voted Reagan Simon, absolutely. Exactly. Which, um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know. The, what the future of the Republican Party is not pleasant right now. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I have to, to concur that, I mean, part of it is certainly the demographics. And, I mean, the fact that you've got two congressional seats that are in play in what was designed to be safe for the rest of the century Republican districts is, you know, is, you know reinforces Paul's point about the changing, uh, changing demographics. So uh, the P Republican Party is going to have to realign one way or the other. Uh, on the other hand, the Democratic Party, you know, the downstate Democrat is going the way of the Buffalo, and that means that the Democratic Caucus is going to be much less diverse than it was 20 years ago. So you've got realignment within the state, 
And in, you know, for the foreseeable future, you need a moderate Republican candidate that can still hold the base and, uh, uh, you know, appeal to independents. Uh, you know, I think the Edgar Thompson kind of model still holds in terms of the kind of Republican that you've got to put forth to win uh, statewide, certainly in terms of the governor's chair. Well, in, in Judy's case, in the, in the primary, if it wasn't for, well, Suburban Cook and DuPage County, that's where her numbers were uh, uh, in that, in that four-way battle. It's just very strange to me, after all the years that I've done this and, and, and looking at it, how things have really shifted around. When you think back a few decades, you get a little older, you say decades, you don't say years, uh, you a few decades, look at the big top vote getters. The Democrats had a parade in order to compete. Paul Simon, Alan Dixon, downstate Democrats, Durbin. I mean, it was, a, it was the, the best of all worlds. You get a downstater, with a, with, you know, it would combine it with Chicago, and you, and you squeeze the state from the top to the bottom and the bottom. You don't need that anymore. The entire Democratic ticket right now is from Chicago. All right, look what happened to Manjuri in the Pardon? primary. The Manjuri in the primary for treasurer. Yeah. I mean, they tried to put a downstater on the ticket, and he got beat by Chicago Democrats. He got beat by Chicago Democrats, and the, the, the speaker and the chairman of the Democratic Party is not a good loser. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, and uh, oh. that'll be, we had that debate coming up, Giannoulis uh, uh, versus Rodagno coming up here, and uh, it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, the moderator will really throw some really unfair questions about that. I mean, I, holding his firepower for the moment. Well, Kathy, you're always the first person. Get up there. If you have a question, uh, Kathy Posner, the, uh, the, raw, the raw protoplasm of the city club, will start the first question. Okay, I have two, so... You can have two. There's You're no Kathy line Posner. behind me, I'll do two. Okay, first, none of you address the power of unions like SEIU, which, are giving, which give so much money to Democratic candidates and can get out thousands and thousands of people on Election Day to get other people out to vote. How can the Republicans... And I'll, just so, to make, so the audience knows, I'm a very conservative Republican. What can Republicans ever do to combat how much do the unions like SEIU can get out there? Anybody want to well, pick that one? better candidates, better message, you know, and, and focus on getting people out to work. It's always been a problem with, you know, although DuPage has been the exception to that. But SEIU, you're right. I mean, they put a couple of million dollars in a, to Blagojevich's campaign four years ago and filled a downtown hotel a week before the, uh, uh, the I think it was the Democratic primary four years ago. Uh, for him, uh, uh, so that's where they housed all their workers. I mean, they're, they're, they're incredibly, uh, they're not only big, but they're incredibly smart. I mean, they're very forward thinking and they, and they, have, they have activated their membership and, and, you know, I don't know what you're going to be able to do, but uh, they're just going to get, they're going to get better as time goes on. And they have in, in the last four years, they've become a lot better. Holy kid. But then when you think about it, and obviously we don't want to steal any Larry Sabato stuff. Obviously, it's kind of silly for me to say that. But uh, when you think about it, nationally, the Republican Party is doing a great job of getting out its vote. I mean, uh, the Ohio race for, for, for Bush and Kerry, even though... Yeah, when they target it. Yeah. yeah they, they, they get out to vote. Why is it not working in Illinois? I mean, that, th there is far more going on here than just the stuff that we've been saying. Uh, is it a lack of leadership? Is it, you know, the Republican Party in Illinois, has it just been starstruck, you know, when you had a guy like Thompson and Edgar, superstars, and, and everybody else sort of just wasn't shining very much? Is the state Senate not producing any superstars? The, st the House? The Congress? I mean, we had Congressman Kirk here uh, a, a month ago, and our good pal Tom Roser, uh, uh, fell in love with Mark Kirk. And I, of course I said, Tom, you know his views. And Tom, <laughs> who's not a man who uh, takes uh, you know, criticism very well, says, yeah, but he could win. Now, if Roser's beginning to come around, then maybe there is hope for the Republican Party. He could win, which is a strange thing. But yeah, I mean, the Republicans have been able, with Carol Rove and all the rest, have been able to get out their vote. And in Illinois, they haven't been. And there's got to be a reason. And honestly, I don't know what it is. All right, Kathy, question okay, number then, two. Then the second part. I'm a conservative Republican, but in any election, I'm going to vote for the Republican, even if they're a moderate, before I'm ever going to vote for a Democrat. Why are, my, uh, why are conservative, other conservative Republicans punishing, let's say, Judy, because she's more liberal? What, what do they accomplish by voting for the Democrat? 
Well, I, I, they are conservatives who, you know, usually vote Republican. They're conservatives first. And, I, you know, I think that's clear. You can't read the, you know, the angry family taxpayers network, you know, whatever the group is. But the is. Democrat is worse than the, than the uh, moderate Republican, so still why would you vote well, for the Democrat? Well, again, it, it is about, I think Paul was exactly Purity. right. It's, the, it's, it's an ideological. It's being, you know, I'd rather be right than win. And uh, that's, you know, and that means that they are a part of an ideological group rather than a political group. I mean, it's the difference between a political party and an ideological group. And so I, I don't think there's any, any solution to that other than to make them more political and less ideological, more pragmatic. And, and that would go counter to, to you know, the way they're organized. Going way back in Chicago history, and we'll do the Chicago next panel, but there used to be, a, we used to have two aldermen per ward, an aldermanic race every year, including a primary. I was round the clock politics. Yes, I was born much too late. Uh, but they used to have a great phrase. Rule or ruin? If you can't rule, you ruin. The last thing you want is to have a person in your party who you don't particularly care for or the wrong philosophy win, because it's much easier to beat the, your, your, uh, the opposing party's candidate than to beat an incumbent in a primary. Old Chicago tradition, rule or ruin. And that's what it seems taking place now uh, with some of these blogs and some of these websites, you know, uh, um, these vicious attacks, can't wait to, to Pinko loses so that two years from now uh, they could win a primary. It's a very strange phenomenon. All right. Thank you. I'll turn over to Peter Scozzi. Thank you. From Can TV. So much attention today. I love it. Um, my question is to Kirsten about um, I too am shocked by all the headlines and they're seemingly they have, that they have no effect on the voters. Um, what, to what do we attribute this? I read the newspapers every day. I suspect folks in this room probably read newspapers. Is it that people don't read newspapers anymore? And that coupled with uh, sort of voter apathy, and I'd be interested in folks' predictions about turnout in November, what, they, what do you think the uh, you know, turnout rate's going to be. Um, is it just that politics has become a game for such a very small part of the population? And perhaps you have insight into that. I, d I do agree with you that I don't think enough people are reading newspapers. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, subscribe to the Daily South Town. You will be completely uninformed in November. Um, I, I, I think that is part of the problem, is people are just disengaged. Um, there are so many different outlets clamoring for your attention, and people really would rather sit and watch Survivor than spend time reading their newspaper when they get home from work. Um, I, I also think it's just, uh, it's too much. We, one of the things that, that Rich wrote once that I really thought was insightful was that a lot of the stories that have been written about the, the hiring scandals and such with the Blagojevich administration, Rich called them pimpy. And they, and they are to a degree. We're, we're jumping at anything um, that looks a little seedy um, and not taking into account maybe the bigger picture. And so uh, people are not, you know, they're, they're hearing a little bit about Bogoyevich. They're not fully understanding a lot of the stories. They're very complicated. I mean, even when you have some of the, some of the best news reporters in the state trying to track down very, um, very dubious links between contributors of, of the governor and contracts at the tollway. I mean, these are not sexy stories. The, the $1,500 check to, to Amy Bogoyevich to spend a Chuck E. Cheese, that, people understand that. But, but a lot of the other stories that have come out, Rich kind of described them one time as, as being pimpy, and I, and I think that's probably a good description. It doesn't, it's not grabbing the attention of voters. Other than that, I really, I, I'm kind of perplexed by it myself, and I'm anxious to see on election day if we see voter backlash from a lot of these corruption issues. But corruption has ranked below education, below jobs, below the economy in a lot of polls when they ask voters to rank the right. issues of importance. So they, they don't care. And they think they're all corrupt, so it doesn't really matter, even if it's a matter of degrees. Real quickly on your turnout question, it, this is the only, this is Topinka's, obviously, it's uh, by her, her advertising, her television advertising. It's her real hope of winning. It's the only hope that she has of winning. And it might work. I'm not here to say that she's not going to win. It might work. A lot of really good, powerful, negative ads might depress Democratic turnout enough in Cook County, is, is her hope, that she wins. 
is not to get those votes, all right, because a hardcore Democrat, you know, isn't going to isn't going to vote for a Republican. What happened in 94, a big reason for 94, was that Democrats were so embarrassed by their national party, they stayed home. The problem with Topinka now is the accelerating um, uh, uh, self-destruction of the National Republican Party that we've been watching all week, all right, uh, for the last seven days. And that will almost assuredly drive Republican turnout down and uh, probably more than she can drive Democratic turnout down, unless they get their act together here soon. And considering the last two years, I'm not so sure they can get their act together in the next four weeks. I mean, we, if, if the Republicans have, national Republicans have a leadership battle, all right, four weeks to three weeks before Election Day, they're, they're done. They might as well just forget about it. By the way, the Democratic turnout in Cook County is going to be bigger than people think simply because of what we saw here last week that Cook County Board President race. Uh, mm -hmm. People may skip the governor's race, right. but they're going to vote in the well, County Board President race. Yeah, I, it, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I just, I mean, yeah, it, Illinois voters are so cynical that they do not believe replacing one Illinois politician with another Illinois politician is going to make things better. So partially the problem is messenger. You know, if the Republican candidate were a uh, an independent, an outsider who was no, had never been involved with politics, who had a lot of pop and charisma, let's say Jack Ryan without the sex scandal, uh, I think Bogoyevich would be 20 points down. Uh, you know, the re if Topinka wins, it will be because the governor's ethical problems are the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, it just, you know, it, it, and, and I, I do not discount the possibility that that could just implode between now and, and Election Day. But that, you know, that's really the, the hope at this point. And, and I, I agree, the turnout works both ways. I think there are things driving the Democratic base that are more favorable to turnout, what Paul just talked about, than things that might drive the Republican base in terms of, uh, in, in terms of turnout. Joyce. I'm Joyce Saxon on the Board of City Club. A question for anyone on the panel. Will we ever get a gambling casino in Chicago? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. Uh, you, that you know that what? would get you to move back, Miller. Yeah, you know, I used, to, I used to live right near where they wanted to put that, and I thought, I don't really need that right over by me, uh, <laughs> just for my own selfish reasons. But, um, you know... I, yeah, uh, I think I think uh, I think in the next four. How about years, a sentence? <laughs> I think in the next four years. Yeah, I think I think yeah. I think that'll happen. If, I, because Rob Blagojevich won't he doesn't want to increase taxes, okay. and exactly. and if he gets reelected, Mayor Daley is going to demand more money for schools, and um, I think that's the best way, the easiest way to do it. It's the tenth license. It's it's not being used anyway. Put it downtown, and. Um, and, and I, whatever he says now, um, I, I agree that he won't raise income taxes, but I disagree with when he says he won't put a casino in Chicago. I think there will be one. Who knows? I could be wrong, but I, I think there will be one. Mm -hmm. Sure. What about I, you, Kristen? And I think Daly backing off the, you know, his, he initially only wanted a casino if it could be city-owned, and that made a lot of legislators very, very nervous. He has backed away from that, and I think it has opened a new door for this to come up possibly in the next session. Your name, please. I'm Joshua Orland. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about going forward after the election or after January. Do you think that the ethical challenges, assuming that uh, Blagojevich is reelected, which I think is a fairly safe assumption, do you think the governor's uh, challenges uh, will catch up with him? And you know, do you, how do you well, see it going forward after January? There's a, there's a saying going around right now that a vote for Rod is a vote for Governor Quinn. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not kidding you. And it's, 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 uh, well, Rob Blagojevich is it, not going to go willingly, I'll tell you that. No. No. Oh, God, that God only knows that. By the no. way, if Blagojevich goes the way things are going, I believe the third person in line, Senator Berman will vouch for this, is Attorney General, isn't it? Yeah. I think it could be a package deal. I, w I wouldn't want to be Pat Quinn if that was the case. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd have a neighbor kid start my car yeah. in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, maybe not a kid. Yeah. <laughs> maybe an old person because yeah. they've lived a long life. Yeah. 
the, the other thing is the era of good the era of good feeling between the legislative Democrats and the governor ends uh, you know at, at uh, midnight on on election day uh, uh, it's going to be you know the governor's going to be in a a weakened position, and uh, the legislative leaders, particularly the speaker, uh, will not be willing to make nice uh, in terms of budgets. And so uh, it's going to be very interesting in Springfield and not boring at all. Uh, although we may, you know, as a state worker, I, I always like to see them pass a budget before uh, they run out of money to pay me. But uh, <laughs> all right. thank you, Mr. Mazur. Yes, uh, Ed Mazur, City Club member. To the uh, panel in general, uh, Kathy posed the question of the um, conservative Republicans and her difficulty in uh, moving to moderate or even voting for uh, a Democratic candidate, but I assure you, you would live afterwards, Kath. But here's my question. Um, there have been three, three um, Republican uh, female candidates in recent history, uh, Lolita Diedrichson, Corinne Wood, and now uh, Judy Bartopinka. Is the opposition within the party based on um, philosophy, or how much of it is a, uh, still goes back to um, gender, or is it a combination of the two? I'd just like your thoughts on that. Why don't you take that first? I'll take that one. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily a gender issue. All three of the women that you mentioned were um, pro-choice, and I think, um, I think the, the conservative wing of the party has great, great difficulty for very... Um, honorable and principled reasons voting for pro-choice candidates. On that issue alone, I think you see um, the, that wing of the party just unable to um, compromise that part of their faith, that part of their um, moral fiber. And I, I wouldn't suggest that in any of those cases voter backlash was due to the <coughs> fact that they were women. I do think Judy Barr, Topinka, and, and Kareen Wood in particular did not do a good job at reaching out to women and trying to um, sort of stir up that base. I'm certainly not seeing that with Judy Barr Topinka. I, I think it, it, if Judy Barr Topinka was, uh, was a right winger, it'd be less so. But if you look at, I, there was a poll done several months ago, and they were asking about president, I understand, but significant numbers, you know, 20% of Democrats would, would now vote for female for president, significantly higher among. Uh, Republicans, so there is part of that is because she's a woman, and I'd make no mistake. Uh, even in supposedly our enlightened age, there there is a significant chunk that uh, not the majority necessarily, but because she's a woman, they're going to do that to her, and they did it to Corinne Wood, and they did it, and and they'll keep doing it because that's until they um, get old and die out. Yeah, and and there's about a. If the Journal Register poll would show about, or the Copley would show about a 14-point gender gap, and you know she has not made the inroads in terms of suburban women that you really would would want in terms of, of uh, you know of getting the kind of majority she needs out of moderates and, and people in the in the suburbs. So you know there is a problem there. Jim Mariner. Hi, I'm Jim Mariner. Paul mentioned the Cook County <coughs> Board President's race, which I don't think you. He, he, the other guys have touched on. He says it will inflate uh, Cook County turnout. Now, I was just at a luncheon last week with you know people like us, people who think they understand politics. <coughs> I heard the opposite theory that there are a variety of committee men, particularly African American committee men, who don't want Todd Stroger in there for a variety of reasons, and so that will. They don't have the power to depress turnout, but they won't goose turnout, and that will hurt. Lugovic. So, is it possible that Paul could be wrong? <laughs> he may be even probable. <laughs> so, I mean, right so now, is that question posed? Todd, Todd, Todd Stroger, you know, he's not firing anybody up right now. I mean, it, it, nobody's, I, you don't see massive rallies of 50,000 people downtown for Todd Stroger for Cook County Board President. Most people don't. You know, I mean, I've made the flippant remark that a lot of people still think John Stroger's that white fisherman from his first ad, if you remember that from years ago. They don't pay attention to county board. They, I mean, they, and, and that's not just in Cook County. It's every county. Nobody pays attention to it. And I, I don't think that it, yet, that he has the ability to fire people up. I do, however, know his campaign manager, and he's a wily guy. And um, I wouldn't put it past him to to um, take, let's say, take advantage of any small error that the other side might make in regards to 
a racial issue and inflate it uh, and use that to inflame the populace. I, and I think that will happen. Um, in fact, I know it will happen. It I'll has to happen. I'll just make a quick comment in defense of Paul Green. Uh, the, the split between the South Side and the West Side in Chicago, that if you went to the, to the slate making where they nominated Strozier over Danny Davis, uh, the big turnout wards in Chicago are on the South Side. Those middle class South Side wards. Man, they turn out too. Uh, oh. If some West Side ward doesn't want to turn out, or some Hispanic ward doesn't want to turn out, the numbers are insignificant. But uh, I could tell you from sources I can't reveal that those big turnout South Side wards are working overtime to get that turnout for Strozier. Uh, and uh, there's an awful lot of jobs at stake. I know right. in, in, in the new day in Illinois, talking about jobs is sort of, you know, Patrick Fitzgerald's <laughs> everywhere. Uh, but uh, uh, the eighth ward will come in with a margin victory for Strozier, probably between 20 and 25,000. Right. In, those an off the, year, in an off-year election. Those are the eight or nine top turnout wards in the city of Chicago, yeah. uh, are, are African-American wards. And it's, if you include the 19th, which is kind of and I, I, covering the area and living on the south side, I, I do sense that there is a lot of, there's going to be a big turnout for Todd Stroger. 34th Ward, Thornton Township, which was mentioned earlier. I mean, Thornton Township is a township that can tip elections in, in Cook County. And it's, it's run by a supervisor and a Democratic committeeman who uses the old uh, methods of getting people to the polls. And those are going to be the important things um, to do on election. I mean, he has the buses. He's got precinct workers checking to see who's been to the polls. It's a very organized effort, and he's with Todd Stroger. Okay, let's hear Mark Berman's question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Jim, by the way, is the author of this wonderful book on the history of the City Club of Chicago, which I know, don't worry, you'll each get one. Go ahead, uh, Senator yeah. Berman. And he's Thank writing you. a new book, uh, too, by the way. Yes. Good morning. I'm Art Berman, a former state senator. Uh, I wanted to know the comments and prediction, perhaps, of the uh, panelists on the two hot suburban uh, congressional races, uh, the one for Henry Hyde's seat and the one uh, where the incumbent is Melissa Bean. Could, I, could you comment on the, those races? You know what, I mean, I, I, the big question is uh, in, uh, in, in the Duckworth race yeah. uh, against Peter Roscoe. The big question is that man right there, okay? Because Ooh. if wait, wait, ready? one, two, three, Ooh. <laughs> because most of the polls have this close, a very close race. A last poll, uh, uh, Reuters poll, published this week, had Duckworth up five points. All right, but with any machine, as is not what it was, but it still can be called that. With any machine, it doesn't matter what the poll says because. Uh, as you very well know, coming from that sort of a, an environment, is that in the last couple of weeks of an election, the machine will kick in and just blow out somebody who thought that they were going to win the race. So the Page County Republican Party chairman, uh, it will be responsible for electing Peter Roscoe, if he can still do it. So that question should be addressed to him. Can he still do it? He'll tell you. He'll stand up today and say, oh, yeah, I could do it. Kirk. That's, well, Senator, that's State Senator, Senator Kirk Dillard. Senator, oh. Senator Dillard, did you want to comment? Okay. No pressure. I would quickly comment. I have been, we have a campus up right there. Melissa Bean, who happens to be a graduate of Roosevelt University, uh, never took a course from me, which explains partly her victory. Uh, but uh, his office is a block away. Uh, she obviously is very smart in the sense that she is, placate, is playing to her district. And that U.S. Chamber of Commerce endorsement was brilliant, which you know really does take away the, the, the anti-business kind of thing. And whether or not they give her a dime or anything, it's irrelevant. It just knocks down something that her opponent could say, the usual stuff. I think in the sixth, I, this, is pain, this is painful. Uh, I think Miller's probably getting close to being right on that. I think, uh, I think Duckworth, um, she's going to have to be ahead by more than five points in one poll t to pull this out. I do think that that district is, uh, Roskam is a, is, a, is a known quality and, you know, fairly successful. And I just think it's, 
that is really too close to call. I would, I would not think it's a five-point difference. I think whoever w wins the campaign from today to November 7th is going to be elected. I mean, I think that, that race is at hand. I think that race is really at hand. I think Sabato is going to say it is the number one congressional race in the country right now. I mean, it is that. People are calling me up, coming in from all over the world for, the, for that race. But remember, one quick point, and Kirk could probably vouch for this, Hyde's numbers in that district have been going, have been going down, I mean, into the mid-50s. I mean, you know, not 70s okay. or 60s. They've been going down, 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 down against less than nationally known competition. Now, this woman is, you know, obviously has an incredible array of, of things going for her. Uh, but still, it's still, a lot of that is west of where the battle lines are. And I would just think right now that that's turnout, getting your people, their field organization is going to make the difference. So basically, I agree with Miller. Uh, excuse me, I'll have to leave the room for a moment. Yes. Kristen? I just had one comment. If, if Senator Obama at the last minute here cuts an ad for Duckworth, I think Peter Roskam is in big trouble. But I think right now, if, if the race plays out the way it is now, I think Roskam why is would, probably Why busy. would you say that? Why, <laughs> why would an Obama endorsement? Did you watch the Treasurer's race at all, the state Treasurer's race? Were you asleep during that whole Yeah, thing? I watched the Treasurer's race, but, you know, Obama I, I, was was very crucial in getting her and and plucking her from basic obscurity to get into that race. And if he senses that um, a, an endorsement by him that she can put on the air would be helpful, and he agrees to do that, I could see that being problematic. Among all right. I have one one more sure. point to make, and this is this is not in, in any offense against the senator over there, but <laughs> if. Uh, that the, the page, not this one. No, <laughs> I would never offend you. It was, the, um, the Page County Republican Party is much better at winning primaries than they are at winning generals. I mean, uh, uh, fighting hard-fought generals because they just don't fight a lot of hard-fought general elections, and um, very very few elections ever get that close in Page County. Um, so, I mean, this is going to be a good test of him. And sorry to put you on the spot like that, but. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, you're on the spot. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Next. Thanks, Art. State your name, please. I'm Eric Davis. I'm an Oak Park Township trustee and a proud uh, member of the organization in what might be called the People's Re Republic of Oak Park. Um, my question is regarding candidate recruitment, and the Duckworth um, uh, example actually gets to that. Um, I supported Tammy's uh, uh, contestant in the primary, but I have to say she's been a terrific candidate, and she's had a lot of help, but she's done a very good job as a candidate. Um, we are the beneficiary of Don Harmon, who is a terrific state senator and who was recruited and put forward by some elders within the party. Um, and we're very, we're very fortunate. The, the, I would contend that the governor's race might have been lost in the 2004 Senate race when the Republican Party ended up putting up Alan Keyes. Um, when that became the case, it became clear that the cupboard, in a very real sense, was bare. And I, I think Judy Barr uh, has some, uh, some positives, I think all do. I think the parties are benefited when there, are, there is vigorous opposition. Someone told me they thought Judy Barr Topinga would be a, a better candidate for Cook County Board President than for Governor. Um, but my question is about candidate recruitment. Is there the mechanism within the Republican Party um, of, of elders to come up with, let's say, their own Don Harmon kinds of candidates to run in these down ticket races because that's where the, the better candidates come from down the road? Uh, I think money is clearly important and message is clearly important, but at the end of the day, it, it, a lot of it boils down to who the individuals are that are chosen. Um, we seem to be the beneficiaries of a solid group of elders who pick some pretty good candidates, and they make some mistakes, but generally the recruitment is very good. Is that mechanism in place mm -hmm. in the Republican Party? And if it's not, why, is, why not? Well, I'd, I'd argue that it's not in place that all that much in either party. I mean, you've got very good recruitment and legislative leaders in terms of looking for people in districts. You obviously nationalize recruitment in terms of Ducks, Duckworth's was recruited by the, the National uh, Democratic Campaign Committee. Uh, but statewide, you're getting, you know, the days of slate making to a large extent, you know, have gone, have been gone for a long time. And, and Rod Bogoyevich essentially was self-recruited 
uh, when he thought he was in danger of being redistricted out of his uh, seat. Then he opened up the Prairie State Committee. Uh, you know, Giannoulis was self-recruited and uh, ended up, uh, you know, beating the, the, the slated candidate, the endorsed candidate. So I'm not sure either party does that well at the statewide level. It's, it's about what kind of farm team do you have and, and how open you are. And, and I think clearly the Republican Party, when the Jack Ryan is an ex nomination, was an example of their, their willingness to, you know, to, to look for a candidate that's, you know, that's a fresh face. And, uh, but you're going to get, you know, I mean, you're going to get more and more self-recruitment rather than less. I mean, the self-recruited uh, multi-millionaires have not been winning most of these, but, uh, you know, that, that's just going to continue. So I, I'm not sure either party is very good at, 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 this, at, at really putting together slates anymore. Obama, however, if he decides that he wants it on the Democratic side, again, we're avoiding the actual question here, but if he, uh, I, you know, some believe, especially in Jesse Jackson Jr.'s organization, which is massive, believe that uh, this could be the first step, this Giannullius kid, if he wins, um, uh, could be the first step towards remaking the, the state Democratic Party here, more in Barack Obama's image. And I, I don't know whether Barack really wants to do that, but uh, I, some think that might be a test case. As far as the Republicans, I, you know, the self-recruitment, uh, because there is no real strong leadership at the top, and, and you're absolutely right, the, the, the recruitment of Alan Keyes showed just no imagination or the wrong sort of imagination. Uh, it showed a lot of imagination. It was just kind of goofy. I don't know what they were smoking, but because you get a lot of goofy ideas that way. And, and, uh, and it just showed that it, they just didn't have, an, it, you know, they got no bench, man. They, I would just add real quickly, at least in the south suburbs, in a lot of these areas that used to be strong Republican holds that are now switching to Democrats, you have Republican committeemen and township committeemen who that is their primary purpose is to get people um, to run for office, to you know, to get um, candidates to slate them against Democrats, and they're in the pockets of the Democrats. So until you solve that problem, you know, we, we have. Um, number of open seats in in the south suburbs that agreeably you have to find a Republican who's kind of willing to run out there on his own um, and with no money and, and little support but they're there I mean there are cases of people who've approached Republican leaders and said hey I'd like to give it a shot and they're not getting their phone calls returned so okay. all right next uh, hi I'm Ferd Isserman I'm a member of the city club and I'm retired but I'd like to ask this question um, what do you think of the proposed electric rate freeze? Will or will Bogorovich call, excuse me, <clears throat> the legislature, excuse me, <clears throat> back in session? And how do you think it will cut? Well, um, what I've been telling my subscribers is, you know, Madigan, Speaker Madigan wants this thing. Uh, we don't know fully yet whether it's just completely political. Um, but he, he doesn't like Commonwealth Edison. The problem with calling a special session is Senate President Emil Jones is ComEd's biggest ally in the General Assembly, <coughs> um, uh, without question. Uh, and he doesn't question him a lot. And, and, but, but more than that is that Emil's, uh, Emil Jones is, is only defending one seat and going after a whole bunch of other seats. And, uh, and some incumbents as well. So like Cheryl Axley out in the Cook County suburbs, uh, appointed state senator, if there's a special session, if they get a rate freeze bill to the floor, Axley votes yes on that, that's going to help her get reelected. Well, he don't want to help her get reelected. He wants to defeat her, so he doesn't want to give her that opportunity. There are more examples like that, but, but right now the governor's in the middle of a rock and a hard place, okay? If, if, if he goes along with Madigan, calls a special session before the election, Emil's going to be terribly upset at him. And uh, that bill just may never get called, and, and Blagojevich was lo losing like a mope, you know, a couple of weeks before the election. No, no, I think you're reading too much into it. I think the battle is already over, that the call for the special election gives those downstate Democrats a chance to support it. It'll never take place. Madigan gets what he wants, Emil gets what he well, wants, and the governor skates through. I mean, exactly, except, except that they keep pressing the governor on this. Well, I mean, they, there's more to come on this. It's, it's not that he just announced it and then walked away. Madigan doesn't just announce something and walk away. 
He's never done that. And he keeps pressing, and they're, they're going to hold a hearing on Monday. They're pushing Cub into, re into releasing its list of, of yes votes in the Senate to put pressure on Emil Jones and to put pressure on Governor Bogoyevich. So, yes, it's political, and I totally agree with you. But no, I've never seen him just come out with something in 16 years and then walk away from it. I mean, I've seen Daly do it, and I've seen Blagojevich do it, and I've seen my other, a lot of other people do it, but I've never seen him do okay. it. All right. Thank you. Ah, Mr. Sunshine. Go ahead. You got 12 seconds for your commercial, unlike last time when you took 35. Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs, airing every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. on cable channel 21, Can TV throughout the city of Chicago. And you should have your shows on YouTube, you know. It would be a lot easier. We'll, we'll work on that for you. Okay. All right. We also we do have a podcast page right off our blog site. Right, but you need to put jeffberkowitz.blogspot.com. How's that? <laughs> 32 seconds. Uh, going back to the governor's race, it seems like the panel uh, somewhat bashing Republicans, and this is a good crowd to do that, and because you're here, Jeff. Well, I'm, not, I'm fair and balanced, but well, there aren't well. many too many. My guess is there are 90% Democrats on the How panel. How can you say that we're room. bashing Republicans when I said that a vote for Rod could be a vote for Governor Quinn? Let me get to you the know, question. That's, Rich, you never let me, let me ask the question. <laughs> no, you already made a statement. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's a, a preamble. It's, it's a, it's a question, Jeff. Okay. Come on, F and B, let's go. Well, the, the, the question is, are you bashing Republicans, bashing conservatives? The question is, are you being too hard on conservatives when you, you seem to be saying that Judy's having problems because the conservatives are being sore losers and now rallying around her. And you got Bill Brady and Oberweiss, who Rich said had the majority of the vote in the primary. Brady, heck, probably endorsed Judy before the primary was over. Oberweiss has endorsed her now. So you got Jack Roser, the only conservative out there you can point to, who's okay. given Judy a tough time. And everybody here marginalizes Jack. Jeff, so before you... Before, that's the question. Jack, Jack you know Jack, what, Jack? How many... Jeff, Jeff, I, Jeff. No, I'm saying Jack Roser. How many elections has Jack Roser won? He won one primary this year. Matt Murphy, state senate candidate. Good guy. Uh, but other than that, he almost win, He wins almost nothing. Okay? So, I mean... If, if you want to say that, I, that we're bashing conservatives, we're not bashing conservatives. We're bashing people that don't know how to win elections. No, that's and whether they, were, whether they be conservative or liberal doesn't matter. And if you've got a track record, fine. And if you don't, then we're not, ba we're not no. taking out an ideology. Rich, two hypotheses. One, Judy's not doing well because conservatives are hurting her. That Another, was one part of the argument. That's yeah. what it sounded like. The other hypothesis is, I, as Professor Green would know, that famous saying, ideas have consequences. The, camp, the Topinka campaign rolls out a budget plan, an ethics plan, education plan, but nowhere in the campaign does she campaign on those ideas and those programs, and maybe that's why there's not much interest in what Judy's saying or is doing. Do yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that we're bashing the, Repu the Nobody has answered wing the of the question. Republican Party. We're raising a legitimate point that, that it, that's not unified. There's not unity behind that candidate. And it's different from the Democratic side where you do have conservative Democrats and moderate Democrats who work together. As in Glenn Bouchard with all the liberals wandering off no, to as in sit a lot at home? Of, no, as in the fact that the, that's the, eight House, years ago. the House Speaker right. happens to we be pro-life. We speak pro -life, in decades, remember? And there are a lot of um, Democrats on, on in the House who are pro-life. There are a lot of reasons why Judy Barr's Topinka campaign has not caught fire. I don't think ideas. we're saying that is yeah. ideas. Uh, lack precisely, of ideas. Precisely, precisely. Like, and, and actually, I, 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 to a certain extent, I, I mean, I actually do want to agree with part of your point. I mean, part of the problem don't is that it is incredibly difficult, if all things are equal, for a Republican to win statewide in Illinois because of what's happened with the demographics. But, you know, you still have to run a campaign. And, you know, the joke around uh, some of the people that I talk to is that the Topinka campaign is set up to really kick in right after Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> and so... That you know, soon, you think? Yeah. So it, it really has been a problem. It's not... People are, are 
very comfortable, lots of people are very comfortable voting against Rod Bogoyevich. His numbers are incredibly bad in terms of approval, is the state going in the right direction, everything else. But people are finding it very, you know, they're, they're trying to find a reason to vote for Topinka. The people are dissatisfied with Bogoyevich and they're having a hard time doing it. So, I mean, I, I do fault the campaign in that you just, you know, why is she running? What's the vision? What's the message? It, it's not been there. And that doesn't take money. You know, it doesn't take money to be able to articulate where you want us to take the state and what your vision is. And, you know, again, I've known Topinka forever, and, and I think she's a terrific lady. But I, I think that it is just, you know, there has been a real failure to communicate. There's so, no, if you, if you ask what, what is Judy Barr Topinka, what is her campaign about, the, I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is Rod's worse. Rod's a bad guy. She doesn't have a theme. You don't went on issues. You don't went on individual issues. You went on themes on a statewide race like that. And she has no theme. All um, right. All oh. right. Jeff, th thanks again for your very short question. It was well said. <laughs> I, just remember when you win a four way primary race with less than 40% of the vote, and if you want to pick out a theme, that to do that, it's very difficult given the fact that you had such a split within the in the primary race, it is very difficult to get a unifying theme r immediately afterwards. And I did not know that, that the milkman has uh, endorsed her. Uh, I would be- Well, what he says is this, when I've asked him very briefly, do you officially endorse her? He said, what does endorse mean? I'd certainly rather see Judy there than Rob. But he hasn't officially he did a, endorsed her. He did a fundraiser for her. Yeah, he sponsored a fundraiser. fundraiser. What do you want him to do? That's enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The milkman, well, that's his due respect. Pretty soon gonna endorse Ryan, too. Okay, uh, Sharon Alter. Uh, Sharon Alter City Club, um, but I should also say that um, for many decades, I might add, I taught history and political science at Harper College, and this fall I'm teaching a course on women in U.S. politics at Roosevelt University. My question is related to something nobody on the panel really emphasized, and that is, in particular, in suburban Cook County, plus DuPage County, and a number of the other collar counties, but I'm more familiar with suburban um, Cook County and DuPage County. The demographics of the populations have really changed. And when I say changed, um, of an increasingly larger Hispanic population that is voting Democratic, um, an increasing alienation among younger people, in part because of Iraq, and in part because of George W. Bush, uh, what I've been getting anecdotally from a number of uh, students in the Northwest suburbs is they are coming from Republican households and voting Democratic and having Democratic identification. Um, my question related to that is um, to what extent long term as well as short term regarding this um, upcoming election, in particular in the Duckworth contest and in particular in the Bean contest, that increasing change as I see it in party identification among young voters as well as middle class, uh, older middle class voters um, offset the Republican machine of getting the voter turnout. In particular in Schomburg Township and in particular in DuPage County. Well, wow. that's what the Duckworth and Bean Handle campaign. That question. That's we what the it. Duckworth campaign hopes, right? That they can use these national issues to outweigh the, the local organizations. Uh, you know, I mean, that remains to be seen. Again, if she's only five points ahead, she's going to need to be more than that, unless this national Republican thing continues along this path, which, which no matter what. Uh, Senator Dillard's organization does is it, they're not they won't be able to convince people to come out to vote they couldn't do it in night the Democrats tried like crazy 94 to get people out and they couldn't do it the Democrat Democratic voters just wouldn't vote um, and um, so you've got a combination of a couple of things there and yeah I mean it, it the, the beauty of elections is since we're not a dictatorship we can't tell you exactly what's gonna happen and um, I certainly can't, and, and I won't, but it, it's, that is a fabulously interesting race. Two excellent candidates. Um, you know, I've known Peter Oskin for a long time, and uh, uh, two very good candidates, and, and Duckworth couldn't possibly be a better Democratic candidate for that district, so, and for this time. Do you also want to comment on the Bean contest? Well, I mean, I, you know, the bean contest, and you can ask uh, Sabato when he gets here, but it's starting to fall off the radar. Um, 
because of things like the U.S. Chamber endorsement, because of you know some of her conservative votes and conservative issues. But man, are they blasting her in the mail? Um, you he know, had two, six, what six, six yeah. direct mails before Labor Day or something. Like that. Oh my goodness, they are just, just, and it's the National Republicans mainly doing it. I mean, they had a piece with Bin Laden on it, you know, on immigration. Um, too liberal for Illinois. Um, they were calling her. It's, right, she's, as, get, she's as conservative as Glenn Pichard, except on abortion. Yeah. Right? Let's get let's get our, our final question before we step up, Billy. We have a candidate for Cook County Board President, Tony Pareka. Tony, stand up. There you go. All right, Billy Hood from American Airlines. You close the session. Okay. Make it a good question. Going to go um, global. Yesterday there was a wonderful speech by Congressman Ray LaHood, which I think you missed, Paul. In this I was very giving room. a speech in Lombard. I'm, I, I'm thinking of running for county board uh, <laughs> in DuPage County. I was trying to build up some support on the Republican ticket. Well, yes, I missed it. Well, Congressman LaHood yesterday, uh, very candid speech, said that um, three very important races for the Republicans in Illinois, and he, he thinks the, uh, the Roscom race is really going to be a mandate on the war more than anything. But he also made gratuitously nice comments about Rahm Emanuel, so I missed breakfast here this morning to go listen to Rahm Emanuel, um, who didn't talk about predictions. And um, at LaHood yesterday said he thinks they may lose the 15 seats to hold on to the House. It's really part of my question. Uh, Rahm didn't make any predictions today. He was all on policy. But then he made gratuitous nice comments about Ray LaHood and Mark Kirk. So <laughs> I don't know what's going on between these, the love in with the only delegation, but the question is do you think that uh, um, LaHood may be right, that they just lose the House because of the Foley thing? which he was very candid about. You know, the, the polling I've seen shows there's a, the, that's a very good possibility. The polling in 90, it, it, the problem is getting to the point where you can accept the, uh, accept the fact that something might really change, and it's hard to envision that. It was one of the problems that people had in 94, predicting that the Republicans sweep down. I mean, it was just so... It was so uh, radical, almost not the Republicans, Jeff, but the um, but the idea of a sweep like that. And so, I mean, I, if you look at the numbers, and I mean, now this this Foley race, you know, is is in play, and uh, the former uh, majority leader's district is in play, and and uh, there's there's districts in play out there that nobody expected them to be in play. And that's always a really bad sign for the for the ruling party. I mean, that's I, I, I don't I don't make predictions, but I'll tell you this is this is going to be this is going to be a really uh, fascinating election night. What do you yeah, and the, and the trend lines are yeah. I mean, if you, all you can say is if things keep going the way they've been going, it's not particularly good news for the National Republicans, and it's not particularly good news for their Republican candidate for governor. All you, I mean, you're just you're not saying something will shake it up, but clearly if the dynamic stays the way that it's developing, uh, you know, then, then those outcomes are not going to surprise me. Kirsten, final comment? I, I would agree. I, I mean, two weeks ago, I, I would have said that it was a pretty safe bet that the Republicans were going to hang on. The Foley case has obviously um, changed a lot of that, but I also will remind you that there's still, election-wise, there, there's a lot of time between now and then where Foley is going to fall off the front pages and Republicans still might be able to recover enough to hang on, um, but it's going to be a lot closer, obviously. How about a nice round of applause for our panelists? Don't move, don't move.